Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great goodness to us. We especially thank you today for your goodness and giving us your word. Pray that you'd be with us as we study that word, give us wisdom to understand it, and help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. I don't know. Last time I was with you, uh, about a month ago, we were uh, doing some of Daniel. I like to get deeper into Daniel, starting with chapter 2. So just a quick reminder, uh, Daniel the prophet is living during the Babylonian exile. So when Israel was at its point. And uh, he's giving us an example of how does a good, faithful Jew live in a pagan society. Which is not that hard to then apply that to how does a good, faithful Christian live in a non-Christian society. And you see Daniel is constantly negotiating, constantly figuring out where does he have to take a stand, where does uh, he go with the flow. In chapter 1, uh, he takes a stand on food. He won't eat food that's against God's law. But he manages to do it in a winsome way and negotiate and, and, uh, and get... Uh, get permission to have a vegetarian diet, and this ends up being a successful thing, and no one's angry at each other, and everything works out fine. It won't always work that well for Daniel, and there's a lion's den coming, for instance, but this time it works pretty well for him. So any questions on kind of that first chapter, just make sure we all remember where the story is. All right, so let's start with chapter two. Uh, Chapter 2, would someone read uh, uh, verses 1 through 4? In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the astrologers to tell them what he had dreamed, dreamt. When they came in, and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. All right. So, it starts out with a dream. Now, this should always make us think of another Israelite who lived in a pagan court who interpreted a king's dreams. Joseph. Joseph, Joseph. yes. Yeah, this is already kind of sending us up as, you know, a Joseph's like story. Which we should remember how the Joseph story ends. He ends up becoming the second most powerful person in the kingdom. Well, spoiler alert, Dan's name is being the third most important person in Babylon by the time this is over. But at any rate, so the king has a dream, and the dream bothers him. So the Babylonians were big on dream interpretation. They believed that dreams could have deep meanings, especially king's dreams. Uh, these and they had dream interpretation manuals. Like we've recovered these in the ancient world, these dream interpretation manuals saying, well, if a, if a king dreams about this or this or this, it means this or this or this is going to happen. Or if he dreams about this, it means the gods are angry, that kind of stuff. And so he has all these experts, you know, magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers. These are experts. They would have thought of them almost like scientists. I mean, we think they're crazy hope of now, but they would have thought these are trained professionals who studied the manuals and knew how this stuff worked. And they could understand what the gods were thinking by looking at signs, like dreams. And also things like flocks of birds and things like that. Like, oh, you know, if a flock of birds went that direction, that may mean this and this and this. You know, they, they, they made able to that too. All right, so any questions about what's going on here with dreams? Do we think dreams mean anything? I mean, I'm asking this open question. Do you think dreams mean anything? I believe so. Okay. Now, this is things that the Bible actually doesn't have a whole lot to say on. I mean, certain dreams mean something, like the dreams that Daniel and Joseph interpret. But do other dreams mean something? Yeah. Well, doesn't Joseph, there are times where the Lord did go to his people in a dream and mm -hmm. reveal something as if, like for Jesus, for example, in his mm -hmm. book. Just Joseph in a dream, or, right? So there is a purpose, but generally, don't psychologists say that dreams are basically your mind is cleaning house? More or less, yeah. Yeah, that's why things get jumbled up in weird ways. Mm -hmm. and things, and 
but a lot of my dreams are like things in the past, you know, like mm -hmm. people that were, were significant in my life and have passed away. And, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, there, so, are, there are the, theories that <laughs> dreams include the past, the present, and potentially the future. Uh, mm -hmm. Every night we have a tendency not to remember most of what we dream about unless we are woken at the time of the dream. Right. But uh, I, I do believe that uh, premonitions are still are present in our dreams. Mm -hmm. I myself have been saved by certain dreams mm -hmm. in my life. And um, also, like she said, the past is wonderful where you have dreams. I continually have dreams where I walk with my father, mm -hmm. even though he's been dead now for 15 years. And it's a wonderful dream, you know, or with my grandfather. And uh, those are of the past. And I know they're, in some regards, very fictitious because they're only in my own mind. Mm -hmm. But in terms of God's involvement, of course, with Mary, Joseph, mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and all the pro prophets, they all were uh, spoken to usually through dreams. Do you think you would add? When I was a kid, I had a dream I was a bowling pin. Okay. And a giant gorilla was bowling the ball out. Oh, wow. That's pretty good. Which <laughs> <laughs> is just a problem. Yeah, so I think King Kong. What we can say safely about dreams is that God has used dreams in the past to give messages. He could still do that because God can do whatever he wants to do. But most dreams are just, you know, our minds going through stuff. Uh, so I'd say most dreams are not significant. And uh, if in doubt, uh, stick to the word. You know, uh, this is what uh, Martin Luther told a friend who was way into a astro uh, astrology. He was way into astrology. And he was like, well, God could give his message through the stars. But we know he's giving his messages through the word. So let's just stick to what we know, guys. Yeah. All right. Also, funny thing, uh, your translation had in Aramaic. The other one's uh, is in the footnote. Um, at this point in the book, the book changes languages. So the first chapter and the first few verses of this chapter are in Hebrew. From this point forward, the book is all in Aramaic till the end of chapter 7, then it goes back to Hebrew. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, it tells us a couple things. One, Daniel's writing about bilingual audience. Uh, Hebrew had been the language of Israel and Judah. Aramaic was kind of the international language, you know, like what English is today. Uh, and, so, uh, and so Daniel's like daily life would have been speaking Aramaic, because uh, the Babylonian court language was Aramaic. And so uh, we're seeing here the Jews are able to function in both worlds and both languages. And so Daniel assumes his audience knows both and just switches between the two of them just like that, like mid-story, like, oh, now we're in Aramaic. And we never go back until we end the chapter seven. Uh, yeah. So, also the switches in language has something to do also with the the structure of the book. Um, the book has two halves: a half that's stories and a half that's visions. And both halves have one chapter in one language and the rest of the thing in the other language. So the languages also help underline uh, where the transitions are between the halves. So the stories have a Hebrew introduction that are in Aramaic, and the visions have an Aramaic introduction that are in Hebrew. Any questions? All right. This is the number one reason to learn Aramaic is to read Daniel. Also, half of Ezra and a bunch of other non-biblical documents. All right. So uh, the king has a dream. He calls all his experts to tell what the dream means. Let's uh, continue. Would someone read uh, verses uh, uh, 5 through 11? The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards in great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, <clears throat> tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. 
The astrologers answered the king, There is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. All right. So you can tell that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't entirely trust his magicians and astrologers. All right, because he realizes that these guys just tell him whatever they want to tell him. You know, like uh, he doesn't know if they're telling the truth or not. He knows they consult their books and stuff, but who wrote those books? They did. Uh, and so he's starting to get the feeling that maybe they're just like feeding him what he wants to hear. But this dream was like so disturbing, he wants to know the truth, even if the truth is a hard truth to hear. So he says, I'll only believe you if you also tell me what the dream was. So they have to like say, oh, you dreamed such and such, and this is what it means. I'm not going to tell you the dream is, you have to tell me. They're like, well, oh, this is how this works. You know, you know, we have a job description. Our job description is we interpret dreams. We don't, you know, we don't tell you what dreams are. He says, aha, aha, now I got you. I know that you're just buying time. And that's very telling what, uh, what the astrologers say in verse 11. He says, no one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not dwell among humans. You know, this is a case of that they, uh, they, they say more than they realize. Because who's the only one who's ill interpret this dream? God. But the question is, does God dwell among humans? Right, yeah. Yeah, our God does. Those pagan gods don't, but you know, the God of Israel is God with us. And of course comes even much more with us in the person of Jesus, becoming one of us. Alright, any thoughts so far in the story? All right, so then verse 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar uh, like, does nothing by half measures. Uh, I actually love this idiom earlier. Uh, this idiom he talks about um, the penalty for not telling the truth. He says... Literally says, I'll have your bodies made into body parts and your houses made into house parts. So I'm going to dismember you and your house. Uh, and so he's like, okay, you can't tell me. Every wise man in the entire kingdom dies, which includes Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So now they're going to die because these other guys are frauds. All right. In verse 14, when Arioch the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Daniel's always the tactful one. Remember chapter one, you know, he was the one who got things done without any fight. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Uh, Ariok explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for him, asked for time, so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning the mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be the name of God forever and ever, Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Yeah, this is an important little psalm here. This whole prayer song that Daniel says here, uh, I think this contains a lot of the message of the book of Daniel. So, what in there uh, is striking to you that you want to talk about? Well, he's praising God at all times. Mm -hmm. Right, that's a big part of Daniel's life. Is you know, even when he's like not allowed to praise God, he still praises God. He speaks of his sovereignty too, because God is in control of time, seasons who's ruling at any particular time. 
-hmm. and where true wisdom comes from, it comes from only um, the true God mm -hmm. um, and his faithfulness to the God of his fathers. Okay. Why would God's sovereignty be an especially powerful thing in Daniel's situation? Remember, Daniel's going to die if God doesn't. Well, yeah. But that's nothing more broadly. That's true. <laughs> Humanly speaking, it looks like Babylon is in control, and Babylon's gods are control. But the truth is that God is ruler even of Babylon. That's going to be a big theme in here, that when the kings of Babylon go against God, God puts them in their place. Anything else in here that uh, is uh, interesting and profound that you want to bring out? This is also preemptive of the next thing that happens to Daniel later, mm -hmm. that he's caught praying. Right. So he has a foundation here of strength, knowing that God is with him, <laughs> which I believe helps him through that next uh, trial. Mm -hmm. I think, too, it's comforting to see that he calls on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to also pray with him mm -hmm. for the outcome, as opposed to just him. And because he refers to that in verse 23 of how God has made known to them, to us, the dream of the king. So. Mm -hmm. You know, coming together um, as the family of Christ mm -hmm. to pray for an outcome of something or to pray in intercession for something or someone mm -hmm. is powerful. Yeah, the little congregation of four. I, I like the in verse twenty-one the phrase he deposes kings and makes right. God's the God's a sovereign the king. above Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it's going to happen because you know. You know, God's going to take down the Babylonians and put the Persians in their place before this book's over. Mm -hmm. Also, has a lot about God as the revealer of hidden things, that the mysteries, uh, the hidden things that God knows and God reveals to His people, uh, which we can think of you know, the entire Bible as being mysteries that God has revealed to His people. You know, the, the mystery of God becoming man. I mean, that's. As mysterious as anything gets, and yet it's been revealed to us. The mystery of the death and resurrection of Christ you know, revealed to us. Also, notice that you know, Daniel attributes all of his wisdom to God. You know, Daniel does not take any credit ever in this book. You know, Daniel's a smart guy, he's a wise guy, he has lots of tact, he receives visions from God. And yet he attributes all of that to God, not to him. Right. Anything else here? And there's, there's you know, four verses, but very rich. All right, so let's uh, continue. Would someone read uh, verses uh, 24 to 28? And Daniel went to Ariel whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Ariok took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. All right. Is that any, anything you want to say about Daniel's uh, conversation with the king? Well, he outright tells them that their gods are baloney. Mm -hmm. He's got the one that's really going to do it right. Right. And all of his wise men are baloney. Mm -hmm. Like all these astrologers and magicians you're asking, none of them can ever help you. Actually, Daniel even would include himself, you know. says, can you help me? He's like, no one can help you, except for God. And, uh, when the king asks Daniel, can you tell me what I dreamt? Daniel's like, no one can help you. No. 
but God can. Right. Yeah, so you know, the one thing, the great humility of Daniel, uh, and also we see God is working on Nebuchadnezzar's heart in this book. This is a big sub theme in chapters two through four, as uh, Nebuchadnezzar, like this incredibly evil tyrant, that God has interest in him, and we'll see slowly God is uh, wearing down Nebuchadnezzar's resistance. Uh, I don't think he ever quite gets there, but uh, yeah, some have speculated that maybe Nebuchadnezzar did, uh, before his death, get faith in the true God. I'm not sure he ever gets there, but he at least gains a respect for the true God. All right, so now we get the dream. Uh, so now, those, they haven't told us yet what it was. You know, Daniel figured it out, but now they've held it back to this moment. You know, there's some suspense. What is this dream that is so important? Here's the dream. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. So it's a dream of the future. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so your majesty may uh, know the interpretation, that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were walk, rock, watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay uh, and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So there's the dream. Big statue, very, very scary statue, made out of five different kinds of material. A rock falls out of heaven, like an asteroid or something, you know. Uh, rock falls out of heaven, smashes the thing to bits, and then the rock becomes a giant mountain. Okay, weird dream. Uh, so now what does it mean? So this was the dream. And now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. Daniel's always the tactical one. Notice that how he phrases this all, you know. Like, uh, He's, you know, he's both honoring the king and he's about to also uh, give him some very, very bad news. But, he, but Nebuchadnezzar is the king, of, is the head of gold. Or you can say the whole Babylonian empire is the head of gold. And this will be an important thing. So the metals are empires. This will also come later in Daniel 7 where the, the different things there are also empires. Uh, after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Uh, next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the her full, whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so he will crush and break all the others. And just as you saw the feet and toes are partly baked clay and partly iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. It will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this king will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture, will not remain united, any more than iron mixes with clay. All right, so Daniel is saying we have a, a pattern of empires. That there will be a series of world empires. One empire will rise, then it will fall and be replaced with another empire. And he describes four empires. Uh, uh, yeah, this is where we get ideas like golden age. You know, the golden age will be you know, this kind of imagery that Daniel's using. All right. So which empires are these? We know the starting point, right? Gold is Babylon. So what's silver, bronze, and iron? Silver might be Persians. Yeah, silver uh, is all certainly the Persians, because they're next. Bronze might be Alexander. Yeah, Alexander the Great, who conquers the Persians. And who conquers and the, the Greeks? Romans. The Romans, yeah. So that's the traditional interpretation, I think the best interpretation. 
Babylon, Greece, sorry, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. And then we have the iron and clay, which I guess is the late Roman Empire. Like, Roman Empire eventually splits into the Eastern and Western Empires. Uh, so, we have this series of empires, uh, which tells us a couple things. One, God is in charge of empires. These empires are not in charge of themselves. They rise and fall at God's good pleasure. So God's like, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, your empire will not last that long. The only place with someone else, so don't worry, they won't last very long either, in God's point of view. I mean, you know, some of these do last a few hundred years. Right. Also, uh, the question is, why does it end with the Fourth Empire? Why does, I mean, history has continued beyond the Romans. So let's get into that, the next little part here. It says, in the time of those kings, those kings being the kings of iron, so Romans are very bad interpretation. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. All right, so what does this mean? What is the significance of, of the rock coming at the time of the kings of iron? Well, that would be Christ. That would be Christ. So then what does it mean that, uh, what are the details then line up here? The church of Christ. Yeah, the, the, the rock and the mountain then is the church, and it's knocked up by human hands. That's telling us what? It's God's church. Yeah, it's God's church. Also, you know, God's Christ. You know, that you know, Christ does not come from human origins, but from God. All right, so we have this, this divine uh, Savior who will set up a kingdom that will fill the entire earth. And even though every other kingdom will end, that kingdom will never end. That is, even though every empire rises and falls, the Christian church will endure for eternity. This is a profound prophecy. Because you think about this, this is being written uh, according to uh, the details in the book during the Persian Empire. So we're talking you know, around 530 something is when this book was written. Uh, and he's talking about uh, the Roman Empire and Jesus. Uh, this is the reason why this book has become so controversial in scholarly circles because a lot of Bible scholars don't actually believe in the Bible. It's a weird thing. Uh, I don't know why they would waste their lives, but there's a lot of Bible scholars who are secular and want to read this as you know just a human document. And so obviously that can't stand. And so th there's a battleground over this book. So the alternate interpretation is that the four kingdoms are not uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. Rather, they say it's Babylon, uh, Media, Persia, Greece. And you say, what's Medea? The Medea, or the Medes, were uh, part of the Persian Empire. So uh, the first uh, emperor of Persia uh, is um, Cyrus. And Cyrus had a Persian father and a Median mother. So he was half Persian, half Median. And so the way they kind of fudge this, is they, they, they separate the Medes and Persians from each other to get two empires. I think this is totally cheating, but this is what they do. So they, they say, you know, we have, uh, so we have uh, Babylon, Medea, Persia, Greece. And then they say, this book was written during the time of the Greeks. Uh, they say that, that Daniel wasn't a real person, that, that this is uh, a pious fraud. So he's writing right the time of the Greek empire, and he's writing about current events, pretending like he's predicting them in the future. And so in this case, it's not talking about Jesus. Jesus isn't the rock. What would be the rock then? Uh, the Maccabees. All right, so let's talk a little bit of Jewish history here. Have you ever heard of the Maccabean Revolt? A couple of you. All right, so in the time of the Greeks, so now we're you know, way past Babylon, in the time of the Greeks, uh, Alexander the Great conquers Jerusalem, 
and then his successors also rule over Jerusalem. And it comes a time when there's a Greek king ruling over Jerusalem whose name is Antiochus IV. Antiochus IV uh, oppresses the Jewish people, and he actually makes it illegal to follow the Jewish law. And he converts the Jewish temple into a temple to Zeus. Uh, this greatly offends some Jews, believe it or not. And a group of Jews led by a guy named Judas Maccabeus, which means Judas the Hammer. That's like his nickname, Judas the Hammer. Uh, so Judas the Hammer and his brothers start a guerrilla war against the Greeks. And that guerrilla war, they eventually overthrow the Greeks and they set up an independent Jewish kingdom, which lasts for about 80 years until the Romans conquer it. So the, 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 the theory for people who don't want to believe the Bible is that this book was written in the time of the Maccabees, and they thought the Maccabees were the kingdom that was going to last forever and ever, which it didn't, but that, you know. So, uh, all right, so what thoughts or questions do you have here? Does this have anything to do with Masada? Uh, that's a different group of, uh, of Jewish zealots. Further. That's, uh, that's when the Romans conquered. That's not in the same time. No, so that, Masada is like around 70 okay. AD. This is like 160s BC. No. So do they have a, like a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, or is uh, it split, the, or eastern, western? So the northern and southern kingdom was, uh, you're talking about the Greeks or the Jews? In, any of the All right. above. All right, so the, the Jews had two kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdom, but those are both gone now with uh, the exile, the Babylonians conquer the southern kingdom, that's the end of the divided kingdom. Uh, the Greeks also had several different kingdoms, that's part of the story. Uh, if I, uh, that, uh, in the time of Maccabees, it's actually a, a, a Greek king ruling from Syria who's in charge of that, because the Greeks split their kingdom up after Alexander's death. All right, so what do we do with this? Uh, how can we show that Daniel uh, Daniel is talking about Jesus and not about the Maccabees. This is become a major part of interpreting this book, uh, and there's a couple you know, places where we just have to uh, have faith. There's other places where we can use our reason and show that this is more reasonable to interpret it the Christian way than the non-Christian way. Uh, and one big one is just the fact that. Uh, the Medeans were never an independent empire, so we can't count them as one of the empires. Uh, but also, a big part of this is um, uh, showing that Daniel is an old book. And there's scholars who've worked hard on this to show, uh, to show that the Hebrew and the Aramaic is the Hebrew and Aramaic of the 6th century BC and not the 2nd century BC. And I, I think that holds up. Also, that it includes minor details about Babylonian administration that a contemporary would have known about, but a later author would have not known about. You know, that it accurately talks about certain details. We talked about last week, oh, last, well, last month, that, um, that we might actually have a mention of Daniel by his Babylonian name in some of the Babylonian archives. This guy, Belteshazzar. Uh, so, also the fact that we have some very old copies of Daniel. Uh, our oldest copy of Daniel dates to the first century BC. And so uh, the critics of Daniel would have to argue that Daniel was written in, in the middle of the second century BC, and by the early first century BC had already been accepted as a holy prophecy from God and was widely available in copies. That is awfully fast for a legend to grow. You know, that would be unprecedented. So th there's a lot of good evidence that Daniel is an older book and therefore is true prophecy. But I wanted to be aware that this will come up from time to time in this discussion as we go through Daniel. Any questions? All right, big tangent there. Back to uh, this. Okay, so he's finished interpreting the dream. Uh, he said, the dream is that God is in charge of empires rising and falling, and he's bringing about all these empires rising and falling so that he can establish his kingdom on earth uh, in the person of Jesus. So let someone read uh, uh, 46 to the end of the chapter. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and land lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at David's request, the king appointed uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while da Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Mm -hmm. All right, so Nebuchadnezzar's response. Uh, does Nebuchadnezzar have faith in the true God at this point? No one has seen not because he makes an image. Well, yeah, in the next chapter he does make an image, yes. Yeah. Which is surprising because you wonder what is his motivation? Is it to try to maintain his kingdom and to show his power at this point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it to just to say, change the future? Yeah, we will get to that. That is important. Yeah. So he talks about the true God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. That sounds like he believes in him. Uh, or do we have to read these words a little differently? He's still thinking of pagan mindset. The God of gods. So he's saying, okay, your God is like the best God. But there's other gods too. He, he's still thinking this in a pagan way. He's like, because ah, pagans have no problem adding more gods. You'll see that uh, all the major pagan religions add gods over time until they get a whole lot of gods. Uh, and they're, they're finally, like, they meet a new country, like, oh, who do you worship? Oh, uh, we'll worship your gods too, why not? You know, worship them all. And then Paul even talks about you know, the, uh, the Romans worship an unknown god, just in case they missed one. Uh, so here, Nebuchadnezzar is, is still thinking of pagan mindset. He's willing to add Yahweh, the God of Israel, to his collection of gods. But he and even admit that he's better than the other gods, but he's not you know, ready to get rid of the other gods at this point. All right. So Daniel and his friends get high positions now. Daniel is now uh, the administrator of, uh, of the royal court. So he's like the vizier. And his friends are now uh, administrators over the province of Babylon. So that's like the state. So Daniel's like in charge at the federal level, and his friends are at the state level, to put this roughly into our terms. Uh, all right, any questions? All right, so so far it sounds like the Joseph story. You interpret a dream, you get a high position. But then this turns uh, a dark corner here, which is the next chapter. Uh, so uh, let someone read ver uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through, uh, one through 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the sub <clears throat> subtraps, perfects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, perfects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials had assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. All right, so the question you had, why does Nebuchadnezzar make himself an image? Well, it doesn't explicitly tell us here, but knowing Babylonian history, actually, can be really instructive here. So mm -hmm. Babylonian history records that around this time period, there was a coup, an attempt on Nebuchadnezzar's life. And so after this coup and attempt on his life, which is unsuccessful, Nebuchadnezzar uh, purges the royal court, that everyone who was suspected of disloyalty is executed. So that's the federal level, that's where Daniel works. But after that's done, then he turns to the provinces. And, he, and he, uh, we know that he gathers uh, the provincial governors to take a loyalty oath to him. It seems that this is the loyalty oath. Basically, uh, to show your loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar, that you're on his side and you're not going to do a coup against him, 
uh, you take that oath by worshiping the image that Nebuchadnezzar sets up. Basically, uh, church and state are very intermeshed in the ancient world. Uh, uh, the idea of separating church and state would be unthinkable to them. And so, uh, and so by doing this religious act, you're showing your loyalty to the state. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Well, in Egypt, the time of Egypt, the Pharaohs uh, thought of themselves as gods. Mm -hmm. And I think most dictators at some point do. Right. So this was one way to prove that he was in fact in control. Mm -hmm. Right. So you worship my god, you're showing that you're loyal to me. So you know, he's purged the federal level, now he's going to the state level. He's you know, going to purge anyone who doesn't show loyalty. It doesn't say, but is this an image of um, Nebuchadnezzar himself? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know what this image looked like. It could have been, uh, or it could have been like, you know, his god, probably in this case Nebu, because he's Nebuchadnezzar. I see. I see. It could have been the god Nebu. This idea is like, like you're worshiping Nebu, you're actually worshiping Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. uh, also, notice the, the, the proportions are weird. It's ten times taller than it is wide. Which means it's not a human. Yeah, either it's not yeah. human, or it could be that it's standing on a very tall pedestal, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, the, or maybe it's in profile. No. But yeah, the proportions are weird. It's really tall. All right, so that's that's probably what's going on. Funny note, uh, we know from other parts of uh, the Bible, reported in other parts of Babylonian literature, that one of the provincial governors who was called to give a loyalty oath was the king of Judah. Because Judah, at this point, uh, is still like a little rump state, and they have a, a king who really has no power anymore, and he will soon rebel and get executed. But at this point, uh, uh, we know that the king of Judah, the last king of Judah, Zedekiah, is brought, uh, is brought to Babylon to take the loyalty oath. So it could be that he's actually present in this scene, that the king, the king of Judah is present. And notice the only people who don't bow are going to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So it, 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 it doesn't say for sure, but it's entirely possible that while Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are refusing to bow, King Zedekiah is on his face bowing down to the idol. Yeah, yeah. absolutely true. Because yeah. he values his life. Oh, yeah. All right. Verse 4. The herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of the fell down and worshiped the image that the gold that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You might notice that this is a really repetitive chapter. Right? We already had a rep repetition of all the different kinds of officials, all different kinds of instruments. Some people wonder if this, if this chapter is intentionally uh, satire. That whenever the pagans do things, it's these long, boring lists repeated over and over and over again. Implying that pagan worship is long and boring, you repeat the same things over and over and over again. Uh, that's entirely possible, because this chapter is super repetitive compared to every other chapter of Daniel. So it could be that this is like all sad kind of making fun of how boring and rote pagan worship is. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of kind of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the prophets of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. So that, the question is always, well, why doesn't Daniel get in trouble too? Remember, Daniel's already been involved in the previous purge. So uh, Daniel survived that purge, and so he's, he's fine. Uh, he's federal level. These guys are state level. Uh, and also notice that they're always called by their pagan names here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Whereas the previous chapter, they were called by their Hebrew names, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. This is probably intentional. The author always calls them by their pagan names in this chapter to show just how isolated they are, how uh, even their names have been taken away from them at this point. 
Okay, any thoughts or questions so far? All right, so 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Notice once again, these pagan savings, they don't actually know what they're saying. Like earlier they said, you know, uh, only the gods can reveal this dream to you. Well, here they're saying, you know, uh, what God can save you from my hand? Don't have much respect for the gods. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. so many of them, he doesn't care about them. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar is himself superior even to the gods. Very interesting. Uh, and also, remember, Babylonian gods aren't like our god. You know, Babylonian gods don't save people miraculously because they're stones. But you know, they don't save people miraculously. So he he doesn't think of gods as people who get their hands dirty in our world. They're kind of like more distant, do more nebulous things, like give you good crops or something. You know? and so you know, he's this false idea of a god. But his question actually, if we take it as a real question, the answer is. Yes, uh, God of Israel, he can save them from your hand. All right, so uh, someone read verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to them, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to be, uh, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God you have set up. Mm -hmm. Then Nebuchadnezzar was we We'll pause there, actually. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so, what do you see is interesting in their words to the king? I'm willing to die for our God, mm -hmm. if that's so good. Yeah. Uh, it's that he says, our God mm -hmm. can save us, but even if he doesn't save us, we still won't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so notice that they're leaving this up to God. They're not saying that God has to save us. They're t totally prepared that God may choose not to save them this time. And that's true of our prayers, too. When we pray to God, we are prepared, to, we're prepared for the answer to be yes or the answer to be no. But whether the answer is yes or the answer is no, we still praise our God and, uh, and trust him. So here, you know, if God saves us, God is awesome. If God doesn't save us, God is awesome. You know, this, 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 is, uh, you know, this is what faith looks like. Any thoughts on that? Just that it's one of the strongest examples of faith that I think we have in the entire world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that and a sacrifice. Oh, uh, Abraham. Oh, yeah. yeah that's another good one. But it doesn't take quite as far. Uh, and these guys actually end up in the furnace before this is over. Just, you know, God saves them anyways. And I think the only other example is that is Daniel and the lions that he's actually in. Then with right, which is the parallel story to this one. You know. Hungry lions. Mm -hmm. and we know that because they were hungry. Mm -hmm. All right, so it says... So this really kicks up the king uh, at this point. The Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, he, and his attitude towards them changed. So before, he was actually trying to get them to do the right thing. You know, like, I'm going to give you another try here. But now, you know, they've thrown it in his face. He's furious. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Now, let, let's be honest here. They didn't have thermometers. You know, they did not know it was seven times hotter. Uh, this is a symbolic use of number. You know, basically make it as hot as you can get it. Is this at the time yet of iron? Yeah, th th this is uh, well, just after the Iron Age. Well, then to make iron, you actually have bellows. Mm -hmm. So what they were doing is they were using probably giant bellows. Yeah, pumping lots of air in there. Which is to, to melt steel. Right. Yeah, so this is insanely hot now. As, as hot as ancient technology can get, which is pretty hot. Uh, ancient kilns can get like 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so it gets super, super hot. Uh, 
he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the fire so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. I mean, this is just to prove that it wasn't just like, you know, you know, smoldering embers, and you know, you know, you know, no, this killed the man who threw the man. You know, this is seriously hot. Then the king of Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. Notice Daniel keeps us in suspense here. What's so amazing? He leaps to his feet in amazement. He asks his advisors, weren't there three men we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. What, are you going crazy? <laughs> He said, look, I see four men walking around the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. All right, so what, so what do we think of this? Is that a good translation? Son uh, of the gods? Yeah, son of the gods, because remember he's a pagan. He's thinking, you know, there's lots of gods. Son of the gods. Son of gods. Well, yeah. some, some scholars say it's the pre-incarnate Christ appearing mm -hmm. as the fourth person in the... Right. The idea is maybe the professor uh, was more correct than he realized. Again, you know, yeah. you know, he said, "Looks like a son of the gods." Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, a son of the god, but you know, yeah. So it could very well be Christ before he became man, who is the one in the in the, in the furnace with them. Uh, one of the ancient translations puts an angel as uh, as, as the interpretation here. It could be. Uh, I like the Christ interpretation because I like to think that, uh, uh, well, the Bible is very clear that even in our darkest places, Christ is there with us. And so here, even in the, the most dangerous place, Christ is there with them. Uh, any other thoughts here? We know that Christ was uh, at the time of creation. Mm -hmm. He was not simply born for the first time. Right. Uh, he was already... Yeah, he had existence long before his birth. So we, we do know, that, or because of that, we, we have a, a strong possibility of thinking that it would have been Christ. In the right. Yeah. And there's other times we see uh, figures show up that may be Christ. Like, for example, a lot of scholars think that the, the figure in the burning bush was Christ. Oh. Or... I even some have wondered maybe the angel of death who strikes down the Egyptians was Christ. Christ fighting for his people. Uh, but that's a big discussion for another time. Whoever was, had, I'm sorry, whoever was obviously was distinct. Mm -hmm. Some kind of distinctive feature. Right. Yeah. And you know, and notice what, he, what they're doing. They're singing. Young. When he refers to him as son, I believe he's referring to someone young. That would be Christ at, in, in his 30s. Mm -hmm. same, same age as when he had risen from the dead. Mm -hmm. So he would have, if he was around that same age, he would have looked as a son to end that miser. Right. Well, I assume that before he was born, Christ looked ageless. You know, like, like not a particular age. But. Well, I'm thinking glorified body. Right. And that's what would be part of that vision, is a glorified body, not just a uh, flickering image, mm -hmm. but actually right. somebody in the flames would be shown. Right. Yeah, it makes himself visible to the right. king. Now, interesting enough, there is, there's a longer version of the story in the Greek. Uh, the, in general, Greek Daniel is longer than Hebrew Daniel. Uh, it seems that whoever the translator was, uh, stuck in some extra little bits. Uh, we're not sure why. Mm. But uh, in this story, the, the extra bit that gets thrown in is it gives us the song that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fourth man were singing together. Uh, and this song actually became a part of the liturgy in the Middle Ages. And it even shows up occasionally in Lutheran sources. Uh, the, uh, the Lutheran service book, I don't know if we have a Lutheran service book around here, any chance? Uh, there it is. Business Service book actually even has this this hymn, uh, this this the text that from Greek Daniel as a hymn. Let's see, it's all all your works of God, praise the Lord. Uh, 
930. 9.30, all you works of God bless the Lord. So, so this, is, uh, this is kind of like a Calypso tune. All you works of God bless the Lord, all you angels now bless the Lord. Come you heavens and powers that be, praise the Lord in his majesty. Raise your voices high, praise and magnify all you works of God bless the Lord. Raise your voices high, praise and magnify all you works of God bless the Lord. You'll see down here it says, Song of the Three Young Men. So that, that's the, the song uh, from Greek Daniel. So it's not actually in our Bibles. It, it, it's not actually probably the original inspired text. But, like, hey, that's, that's a pretty good song, so we put it in our hands. When, when does Greek Daniel first appear? Uh, the oldest copy of Greek Daniel we have is from the first century BC, so like 400 years after Hebrew Aramaic Daniel is written. And so it's, and mostly what the things it adds are extra little bits of interest, like, you know, we get the song they sing in the fiery furnace, or the prayer that Daniel prays in the lion's den, or that kind of stuff. Uh, a couple extra stories that just are like, fun and wacky, like there's a whole story about um, uh, how Daniel was like the world's first uh, like uh, Perry Mason, you know, like, there's this story where uh, a woman named Susanna has been accused of uh, adultery, and Daniel comes in and cross-examines the witnesses and shows that their stories don't agree with one another and gets her off uh, uh, clear and innocent. Now, I don't know if that story's a real story that happened or not, but it's a, really, it's a good story. All right. So, uh, so Nebuchadnezzar then looks in uh, and he calls him out. Verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. So just to emphasize that this wasn't just, you know, they got lucky or something. You know, it wasn't like it, like, it was just like burning embers and they came out slightly uh, toasted. You know, you know, the guys who threw them died, and they come out not even smelling of fire. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. So there, there he, he turns it to an angel. Uh, here probably he's thinking of, uh, of uh, what the Babylonians would call watchers. So the Babylonian mythology, the watchers are like beings that come down to earth and do stuff. Mm -hmm. So he says, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, who were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other god can save them this way. So this is his favorite punishment, that their bodies be turned into body parts and their houses be turned into house parts. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. All right, so... So, a uh, quick check on Nebuchadnezzar's faith. Has he made any progress? Is he a believer at this point? No. Why not? Why do you think? He didn't say it's my God. He said it's the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right, so he's not claiming this God is his own, you know? Mm -hmm. He's still just thinking that, you know, there's many gods, and wow, this is even cooler than I realized. Like he already thought it was cool back when he interpreted the dream, but now he's like, wow, this guy actually does stuff? My God's never doing anything. Uh, I mean, th th this is profound, because you know, pagan gods don't intervene. They, they, they kind of like, manipulate things from a distance. He's got to be wondering, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, make a change here? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is definitely starting to get through to him. I, I don't know if it ever actually entirely does. Uh, and he also respects them enough that he now makes a law saying that no one's ever allowed to say anything bad against this god. So he's like, you know, I don't want my kingdom to be destroyed because some guy mouthed off to this god who's way more powerful than any other god I've met. So we're making a law, you aren't allowed to mouth off against this god. So I mean, you can see God is, 
God is saving his people, but he's also working in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, breaking down his false beliefs one by one. Uh, as I said, I'm not sure he entirely gets there, but God's trying at least. Because God even desires Nebuchadnezzar to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah, and when you think about it, he's given great revelation. Mm-hmm. Nebuchadnezzar is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is actually the, the last time that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a major role in this story. Uh, they kind of fall into the background from this point where you just hear Daniel. We don't know exactly what happened to them after this, just that you know they got promoted to even higher office in the province. So, uh, pretty good that, you know, they defy the king and get a promotion. All right, any uh, thoughts or questions before we wrap up here? Well, in reading ahead, it looks like uh, God is going to convince King Nebuchadnezzar once again through dreams. Mm-hmm. That, right. Uh, he, uh, he must uh, give up his sinful ways. Yeah. So God's going to topple one more of Nebuchadnezzar's idols in this chapter himself. Because mm-hmm. yeah, he's now willing to say, okay, uh, this God's more powerful than me. But he's not quite yet really ready to stop you know, worshiping himself. And God's about to show Nebuchadnezzar that, uh, that he is a small, pitiful uh, worm of a human being. Uh, all yeah. those kings. Uh, which is a big theme in Daniel. God raises up kings and he deposes kings. You know, the, even kings are answerable to the God of Israel. Yeah. You also see God's grace, too, because the Daniel in the next chapter, you know, after revealing what the dream means about the tree and how he's the tree, that um, he says in verse 27, Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed, and it may be that then your prosperity will continue. So there's, a, there's an open call mm-hmm. for him to, to right. repent and have yeah. the opportunity to. Yeah. Which actually is an interesting thing. Why does God send prophecies of woe and, uh, and sorrow and destruction? It's that they don't come true. God gives you these prophecies so that you can uh, turn from your wicked ways and live. So whenever God's uh, proclaims you will have this terrible thing happen to you. It's always out of love. So that, that you turn from your wicked ways and that terrible thing doesn't happen to you. It's kind of like parents, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when I say, you know, hey, stop doing that or you don't get dessert. I don't want to take away dessert. Take away dessert's a huge hassle. But, you know, I want them just to change their behavior. But if they don't change their behavior, I'm going to have to follow through with my threat. And so it's kind of how God works with uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Israel and you know, everyone he gives prophecies of woe to. The best prophecy of woe is one that never comes true because the person changes and lives. All right, any last questions or thoughts? All right, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 